Good Sunday morning and welcome to the program. Welcome whenever and wherever you're watching it. Appreciate your interest in the subject. We are continuing uh, to connect the past with the present in terms of what Christians believe. And we're going to look at a very important aspect of uh, that development this morning. We have looked at uh, a defining of Christian doctrine through the uh, early Christian years and into the early Middle Ages. By the time we get to the high Middle Ages, around 1000, there's a, a consensus that what St. Augustine set forth is basically true. But one problem remains. Is there a contradiction between what Christians believe and logic and reason and science? These are questions that are of concern to Christians today. How do you reconcile? How do you harmonize reason with our faith in Christ? How do you harmonize science with our faith in Christ? We'll look at that today. So I do hope that you find uh, this class beneficial. I do hope that God receives the glory and that uh, the Holy Spirit will direct our studies this morning. So let's begin. Finding our roots, and we call this scholasticism, the uh, doctrines, the work, the uh, efforts of the schoolmen, and the development of theology in the high Middle Ages. Now, there were factors that affected scholasticism. And some of these factors we looked at last week as we discussed the development of liturgy, the growth of towns, the growth of a money economy, people living in towns and having money, which gives them uh, time to do things, and of course, an interaction with each other, and a tremendous increase in education. There'll be the establishment of universities in the high Middle Ages, that period at, beginning at 1000. And these universities are the outgrowth of either cathedral schools or monastic schools. And so again, we see the, the great role that the monasteries played. And, it, as, and as cathedrals grow in the towns, they establish their schools. And then universities come from that. Now, the first outburst of, of uh, learning uh, in early medieval Europe was that of Charlemagne. We've looked at that before, the court of Charlemagne. We call that the Carolingian Renaissance. Remember, he brought uh, 12 different scholars, particularly from the Celtic regions, to his capital at aix chapelle There was another uh, Renaissance in the next century, in the 10th century in Germany, under the Emperor Otto. Now we come to the 12th century, and this is a time when there's an outburst of of learning with tremendous energy throughout Europe, everywhere. It is a cohesive period. It is a stable period, absence of wars and turmoils and uh, plagues. There will be, of course, the Black Death coming later. It was a dynamic, enthusiastic time. It was a time when people could communicate. At least the educated community could communicate with each other anywhere because they all spoke Latin. That was the common language, the common vehicle of the universities. Now the, the center of it all was the great University of Paris. Now what do we mean by scholasticism? Well, let's look at three definitions from three uh, church historians. Alistair McGrath, the reformed uh, theologian, writes this, the medieval movement flourishing in the period 1200 to 1500, which placed emphasis upon the rational justification of religious belief and the systematic presentation of those beliefs does not refer to a specific system of beliefs, but to a particular way of organizing theology. Earl Cairns in Christianity through the centuries, you find it thus, an attempt to rationalize theology in order to buttress faith by reason. And Bill Austin, in a book that I have used in classes in the past, Topical History of Christianity, a new kind of intellectualism 
concerned with the relation between faith and reason, between realism and nominalism. Now, to try to understand scholasticism beyond just those basic definitions, it is the attempt rationally to organize a body of accepted truth. That is, make it logical, it makes sense. It is seeking intellectual as well as ecclesiastical and political unity that we will come to agree intellectually on the Christian faith. Now, for these scholars, the content of theology itself was fixed. It was authoritative. It was absolute. And what do I mean by that? Well, the Bible. Uh, there's an agreement on the Bible. The canon had been defined. The creeds of the ecumenical councils, which we've studied earlier. The writings of the fathers of the church. That was now accepted. And... All of that uh, comes out of a basic acceptance of the Augustinian views of theology. With the exception of Pelagianism, which was defined as a heresy, everyone agreed that the things that Augustine said were correct, with, of course, some modifications with some of them. But the question is, and the question they wanted to solve is whether or not that faith that they now accepted, to which they adhered, was reasonable, was logical, made sense. And up to the point of 1000, uh, and shortly thereafter, the approach to theology was Platonic. And by Platonic, I mean the view that, that uh, there were universals, such as beauty and truth and, and goodness, that had existence in and of themselves. But Aristotle and his philosophy began to return to Europe. And so the question is, can we use Aristotle's deductive method of logic through the process of dialectic, I'll talk about that in a moment, to reach the conclusions of St. Augustine? What is the difference? Aristotle began with the things that Plato rejected, and that is the particular things. Can we use the things that we perceive and, and, and still come up with the truth of Christianity. Now, I mentioned dialectic. That is a methodology of scholasticism. It's a methodology used in other disciplines as well. It's used in economics. It's used in politics. It's used in science. It, it is the method of putting forth a proposition. We call it a thesis, a proposition, and then examining that proposition. Different people examining it and seeing the things that they could agree in and the things that they disagreed in, the pros and cons, if you please. And if they were cons, they would form what we call an antithesis. It would be a, 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 a proposition that disagreed. And then they would debate it and study it further and further until they reached some conclusion, which is called a synthesis. Now that could be repeated. You could take that synthesis and let, let it be a new proposition and again, look for pros and cons and again debate them, and again reach a synthesis, and that way you would move step by step by step toward a conclusion with which everybody agreed. And so that's a refinement that moves toward a conclusion. Now, it's clearly illustrated, this process is, in the Summa of St. Thomas Aquinas. We'll come to him in a moment. Now, what caused this development of thought and challenged the old concepts was this rediscovery of the manuscripts of Aristotle. They had been unknown during the early Middle Ages. They were located in the libraries, in the resources of the Muslim world in the Middle East. And it was two Muslim scholars, Averroes and Avicenna, one a philosopher, one a, a physician, but these scholars uh, re recovered the manuscripts of Aristotle, and from them they were circulated then into the West, and that presented a great challenge, because the Platonic consensus of 500 years was now challenged by the very different approach of Aristotle. And that resulted in two schools of thought as far as the Christian religion is concerned. One of them was more Platonic, 
one of them was more Aristotelian. The Platonic view, which was the early view, has been called realism. And here's the definition, a view of the world based on Platonism that regards universals, ideas, or forms as the ultimate unchangeable reality that exists apart from material things. In other words, beauty is a reality. It's not a thing, but it's a reality, and it exists apart from a beautiful thing. And that is called, in the Latin form, universalia ante rem, universals before the thing. Realism will dominate the early period of scholasticism between 1200 and 1350. Now, you know, by now, there's always a middle position of everything, and there's a middle moderate position we call it moderate realism, it held that universals exist in particular things. Hmm. A, a beautiful rose, okay? Beauty exists in that rose. It does exist. It's a universal, but it's in the rose. And we call that universalia in re. Particular things, here's the rationale, particular things are most real to us. As human beings, we see particular things, like the, the rose. But Universals are most real in themselves. We see the rose as beautiful, but there is such a thing as universal reality, uh, as universal beauty. Now, nominalism is the Aristotelian view, a view of the world based on Aristotelianism that considers universals only a name. The word nominal means name, only a name, but having no independent existence outside the mind. They are only subjective ideas formed by observing the similarity of particular things. So in other words, we see a number of uh, flowers and we say they are beautiful. They, they're, they're all beautiful, there's a group, but, but it's entirely based on the roses themselves, on those things. And so we call this universalia post rem, universals after the thing. And nominalism dominated the later period of scholasticism from 1350 to 1500. Now, before we go further, let's stop and discuss what we call mendicant monastic orders. They play a big role in this development of scholasticism. What do we mean by mendicant monastic orders? Well, we've talked about monasteries before and the tremendous role that they played, the great power that they had in the particularly early Middle Ages. But these are monks, these are orders of monks that operate outside the confines of the monastic walls, monastic community itself. Uh, mendicant means begging, meaning that they receive their sustenance, their support, their upkeep from the generosity of people. Now there are three particular mendicant monastic orders that we need to look at, Dominicans, Franciscans, and Augustinians. Now the Franciscans promoted the ideas particularly of their greatest scholar, Duns Scotus. The Dominicans promoted the ideas of their greatest scholar, Thomas Aquinas. And the Augustinians, which is their name is officially the Order of the Hermits of St. Augustine, promoted the ideas of Gregory of Rimini. Looking at St. Francis for a moment, very interesting person, very important person in the development of Christianity. He was the son of a wealthy textile merchant in Italy. And, and he, was, he went into war. Most of the young men in Italy at this time were involved in war because Italy was consumed by it. And he was just shocked by the horror of war, the terrible things that he saw and experienced. And he, he became ill. I think we would say today it was a post-traumatic stress syndrome. And while he was ill, he experienced a conversion. Uh, he went to a church. He heard the preacher, priest, uh, delivering a sermon on Matthew 10, when Jesus sent out his disciples to preach the gospel of the kingdom, and he felt that was a personal call to him to go out and preach, not only to people, but to animals. And here you see a picture of him. He's preached to the birds and he's telling the birds to go now and spread the gospel. Because he believed in the sanctity of all of God's creation. 
Thus we sing the hymn that he wrote, all creatures of our God and King. And we're all familiar with the great prayer of St. Francis, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. He taught his disciples, those who followed with him, to give up all their possessions to the poor, take up their cross, and of course, follow Jesus. And he lived among the common people and he preached to the common people. And his preaching centered on this particular point, repent and know the assurance of God. There was an occasion when apparently he went into the town square in Assisi and took off all his clothes and handed them to his father who was there standing with him. And he said, Father, I don't owe you anything now. And he went forth to preach. Uh, the bishop who was there thought he'd completely lost his mind and uh, began to, as you see in the last line here, began to persecute him. But St. Francis first went out into the country to a ruined church at uh, San Domeniano and began to rebuild it with his own hands. In the process, as he was doing that, uh, when he came in contact with lepers, he took care of them and poor people. He ministered to them and he preached Christ to everyone and his friends. And understand he came from the upper class of wealthy people in Assisi. His friends uh, followed him out to see what he was doing, rebuilding this old ruined church. And they began to make fun of him and mock him. But he just went on building and asked them to join him. And then they began one by one to join him. His motto was pray and work. But when he was persecuted by the church, by the bishop, he didn't understand that. Now, before we go on with the story, here you see um, a painting by Giotto, which is in the church of Santa Croce in Florence. And his sister is mourning his body in that painting. And on the right, you see his sister, Claire. She established an order similar for women, uh, poor Claire's. So Francis went to Rome to the Pope. And the Pope at this time was Innocent III, the most powerful Pope of the Middle Ages. And he wanted the Pope simply to tell him what he'd done wrong. Why are people persecuting me? Teach me my errors. And the Pope's advisors thought he'd lost his mind and they tried to drag him away. But the Pope did something very strange, very surprising for Innocent. He got down from his throne, got down on his hands and knees and kissed the feet of St. Francis and commissioned him to go and preach the gospel. And if you will look on the right, you see a picture, a medieval drawing of uh, the Pope seated on his throne and St. Francis at this point kneeling before him until he got down. Uh, and in the panel to the right or to the left, uh, you see uh, St. Francis holding up the church. That is, of course, symbolic, the church falling down and St. Francis seeking to restore it. It looks very much like the tower of, uh, of Giotto, the bell tower in, in Florence. And then in the uh, middle panel there, uh, you see the mourning of the body of St. Francis. Now, Francis and the Franciscans had a tremendous influence. They began a great Christian revival and a great advance in theological understanding. Understand they are preachers, they are scholars as well. And they produced great scholars, Duns Scotus being the greatest of them. They deepened people's prayer lives they were involved in extensive missionary activity. Now, at heart of their movement was a recovery of the ministry of the word of God. And then there was Dominic de Guzman, who was the founder of the Dominicans. They are going to be emphasizing true doctrine. Uh, Guzman, Dom Domingo de Guzman from, came from Spain. He was originally an Augustinian. And he preached poverty. He was a mendicant, he begged. He put himself in the service of the Pope, very much concerned about the Albigensians, a heresy in South France. We'll plan to talk about them, Lord willing, next week. And he went to Innocent III also, but Innocent refused to confirm his order. It was later confirmed by Pope Honorius III in 1220. They were given the responsibility of enforcing orthodoxy. Now, the Latin name of Dominicans is Dominicanes, 
And if you split that into two words, domini and canes, it would read the Lord's dogs or the bloodhounds of the Lord. Now, the official name was the Order of Preachers. They emphasized study. They also produced great scholars, the greatest of whom were Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas. They established schools to equip people to refute heresy, and they trained men to preach, and they emphasized preaching as worship. Now, having covered our, our mendicant orders, let's examine some theologians in the period of realism. Remember, this is the Platonic worldview. Now, John Scotus Ergina uh, lived before this period, actually, but he was uh, anticipating the scholastics. He was an Irish theologian. He was a Neoplatonist, a philosopher, and a poet. He succeeded Alcuin of York as the head of the palace school, Charlemagne's palace school at Aachen. He wrote a book called The Division of Nature, which has been called the final achievement of ancient philosophy. And it synthesizes the philosophical accomplishments of 15 centuries. He translated and made commentaries on the work of Pseudo Dionysius. He was one of the few Western European philosophers of his day who knew Greek because he studied in Athens. He stated the problem. He stated clearly the problem, the distinction between the authority of scripture, of Toritas, and reason, ratio. Now, we, we have these two realities, scripture and reason. Can we harmonize them? He defined the problem. The later scholastics addressed it. Such as Anselm of Canterbury, a great theologian, an archbishop at Canterbury. His motto, his governing motto, and remember he is a Platonist, is credo ut intelligam. I believe in order that I may understand. He started with faith, which he believed, of course, was a gift from God. Now, he will operate really in two fields. One would be arguments for the existence of God, which are done from the Platonic standpoint. That is, they deal with ideas and not with things. The monologion and the proslogion and also a theological argument on the atonement, which is found in Curdeus Homo, which is a dialogue between him supposedly and a person named Bozo. But let's look at the monologion for a moment. This is the cosmological argument. <clears throat> it's one that's still used today. R.C. Sproul used it to great advantage. Simply this, that all things that exist have a cause. If the world exists, it has to have a cause. Nothing comes from nothing. And if we take something and we say, what caused that? And then we look at the cause and we say, well, what caused that cause? And we keep moving backwards. We cannot have an infinite regression without God. Eventually we come to God. There has to be an uncaused first cause. Now, the proslogion, the ontological argument of Anselm is perhaps difficult for us to grasp. It's based on the correspondence between the idea and the thing. Realizing it's, it's kind of hard to have just an original idea. There has to be some basis for that, that idea. And so Anselm argued, if we can conceive of a being than which none can be greater, which of course is God, if we can conceive of a being than which none can be greater, then he must exist. Or such an idea could not be conceived. Where would we get it? And if that were the case, if God didn't exist, then you have the idea being greater than the thing, in this case, a no thing. Now, I'll let you think about that for a moment. It's an argument, the more you think about it, it does make sense. But we'll move on to his theological contribution. I think this is a great theological contribution because the idea had been circulating for some time that what Christ did on the cross was to offer a, a ransom to Satan. Because of man's sin, Satan had gained control over man, and the only way God could regain control was to pay a ransom price to Satan. And Anselm did a magnificent job in his Cur Deus Homo, why 
did God become man to point out, to establish by his rational arguments that what Jesus did on the cross was to satisfy the justice of God, that man's sin required a payment and the debt was due to God, not to Satan. Let's move to Peter Lombard, another of the realists, who wrote a book called The Sentences, a systematic answer to a number of theological questions. Uh, he wrote it in a book called The Four Books of the Sentences, Quattro Libri Sententiarum, and these were, this became a textbook uh, in, in medieval universities. And it, the four sentences were split into pairs. That is, the first book dealt with God and Trinity, the second with creation and sin, the third with the incarnation and redemption, and the fourth with sacraments and es uh, eschatology. In Stephen F. Osment's great book, The Age of, of Reform, he has a summary chapter on salvation, and he, and, and he looks back to some of these scholars and just puts in a few words what their views of salvation are. So the view that Peter Lombard had of salvation was that the love by which we are saved, and we are saved by the love of God, of course, that's a motivating factor, the love by which we are saved is the Holy Spirit working within us without our aid or volition, very much in line with St. Augustine. And then it was Hugo of St. Victor who wrote on the sacraments. Uh, he pointed out that the sacrament is not only a sign and symbol, but more. He called it the physical medium through which grace operates. Well, to say it's a means of grace. That led to transubstantiation, which we discussed last week. But he will correlate philosophy with theology. Now, St. Bernard, Bernard of Clairvaux, was a leading intellectual of the period. I'm going to mention now that he opposed the rational views of Abelard, and we'll look at those rational views in just a moment. He was a great Bible scholar, a great preacher. He makes contributions on many fronts. He advanced Augustinian theology, and he was a confidant of popes and kings. He was originally a Cistercian, so I think we need to look for a moment at the Cistercians and what they believed, what their goals were. They were established by Robert of Melesme, uh, Albrecht of Citeaux, Stephen Harding, these were the leaders. Uh, they were established at Citeaux in France. They were focused on scripture, biblical theology, the study of the fathers, the restoration of pure Benedictine practice. Remember that each time a new monastic order uh, is organized, it uses the Benedictine practice as its model. They were critical of secularism, ceremonialism, and materialism, believed in simplifying liturgy and architecture. Now, Bernard presented himself along with some friends and relatives at Sito when he was 23 in the year 1112. And when he was there and became eventually their abbot, they outgrew the monastery. <clears throat> and so Bernard founded a new community at Clairvaux and Clairvaux became a center of great reform. Now he was somewhat of a mystic, he believed that he could, he wanted to achieve a unity with God and to do that is, is to spend time meditating on the love of God. And so he believed that Mary's role was better than Martha's. And he was concerned about how God's love was revealed in the humanity of Christ. His favorite passage was Titus 3, 4. The goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. And he was the great preacher of the Middle Ages. He was called Dr. Melefluous, which means Dr. Flowing Honey. He believed in, the, in proclaiming the essential truths of the gospel. And he stayed very close to the text of the scripture, always pointing to a great conclusion. And he preached daily in the chapter meetings. He believed that true worship sprang from proclaiming the grace of God in Christ. That from the revelation of God's mighty works of salvation 
our faith is confirmed, our hope is strengthened, our love is inspired. His preaching was always evangelistic as he exhorted people to accept Christ. He could make scripture clear. That was a gift. He used other texts to illustrate his central text, and he made application to their experience, his audience, and from their experience. He relied completely on scripture, and he followed the rule of letting scripture interpret scripture. And for Bernard, behind it all was reliance upon the all-sufficient grace of God. Now he wrote songs, and we sing those songs today. O sacred head now wounded, Jesus, the very thought of thee, Jesus, thou love of thou joy of loving hearts, hymns that we sing today. He was also a great scholar, and his students would take notes on his lessons, on his lectures and compose it into somewhat of a systematic theology on notes they took from his lectures on Song of Solomon and also from the Psalms. So in one way, he's a precursor of the Puritans and the Protestants. Contributions, tremendous. Greatest preacher of the Middle Ages, setting a, a standard for preaching throughout the years. He restored the quality of preaching. He is devotional and incisive. He's theologically accurate. He is fervent in evangelism, and he produced excellent literature. His belief was that salvation is by sovereign grace. The Bible is the word of God. There's a difference between what the Bible says and what it does not say. Preaching should always be textual exposition. He equipped people to think in biblical terms and emphasized the supremacy of God's love and salvation. His preaching is relevant, it is applied. It's the theology of St. Augustine linking it to scripture. Let's move to the theologians of moderate realism, this modified middle view. And here's Abelard, uh, he's the one with whom Bernard had strong disagreements. He was a brilliant scholar and lecturer. His two books, for which he's known, Seek at Known, Yes and No, in which he examined the writings of the fathers and showed that they disagreed with each other. And also he wrote an autobiography called The History of His Calamities about his uh, tragic love affair with Heloise. There's a drawing of him lecturing at the University of Paris now, he made contributions. He made more um, assertions of the problem than he provided solutions, but he believed in the supremacy of reason, very much in reason. And so he reversed Anselm's uh, viewpoint of credo ut intelligam to intelligo ut credam. I know in order that I believe. You start with what you know, and that leads to faith. And he said, faith is a decision based on examining particulars. You look at things and, and, you, and you decide to believe. He, in his viewpoint, denied the substitutionary atonement of Christ. He did not believe that Christ died for our sins and he satisfied the wrath of God. Rather, he believed that it was an example of love that... Uh, impels us and motivates us to believe and to come to Christ. Just an example, a compelling example. He denied the Trinity. He denied original sin. He affirmed man's free will. And as we said, he pointed out that the fathers do not always agree and wrote his autobiography. Now, as I said before, he was vigorously opposed by Bernard. Uh, that debate, we could talk about that at length. It went on quite some time. He was condemned for heresy at Soissons and fired from the University of Paris, excommunicated, and fled to the monastery of Cluny for protection. But eventually he repented, recanted his errors, and was reconciled to Bernard, and his love affair with Heloise continued actually married her. And then there was Albertus Magnus, who was the teacher of Aquinas and a great Dominican scholar, an advocate of science, 
His work is in the field of reconciling science to religion. I've had people say, I can't believe in, in Christ, I can't believe in God anymore because we have science that explains things. Well, Albertus Magnus dealt with that, reconciling science to, re to religion, and wrote a compendium on theology and creation. His pupil is Thomas Aquinas, the greatest of the Dominican scholars. He was a son of an Italian baron from Naples who joined the Dominican order. In fact, was, his family did not want him to be a monk and they actually kidnapped him, took him back to his castle at Naples. He escaped from it and returned to the order. He produced the Summa Theologia, the summation of theology, which is a major accomplishment. The first great systematic theology. And in my judgment, uh, the only one that could compare with it would be John Calvin's uh, 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 systematic theology. But uh, he also wrote a book on against the Gentiles, which is a handbook for converting Muslims. Tremendous accomplishment. And he operates by the dialectic. Now, it wasn't accepted at first. It's a complex, vast, ordered system. However, the importance of it is it saved the Christian system from the attacks of science, from those who said Christianity doesn't comport with and compare with and, and uh, it, it, but with science. He united faith and reason as well. And he thus preserved the Augustinian theology with Aristotelian methodology. He said, I believe that St. Augustine was right. I want to reach the conclusions of St. Augustine with the methods of Aristotle. Now he was called the dumb ox. That was not a, said in, in, in hate by any means. It was just a, his friends called him that. It's a little nickname. Why? Because he was a big guy. Because he lumbered along, moved very slowly, talked very slowly. He was uh, challenged by the Bishop of Paris and also by leading Dominican professors at Oxford, but it didn't, he didn't care. He went right on with his work and he refuted the double truth theory of Averroes. What is that? Well, the Muslims, particularly under the great scholar Averroes, did not have a problem with reconciling reason and faith or reason uh, and faith with, with the science. They just put them in separate categories, separate boxes. Here's the category of science, and here's the category of faith, and we don't try to bring them together. And so we have two truths, the truth of science, the truth of reason, and the truth of religion. And to uh, Aquinas, that was not acceptable. So he attempted to, and I think successfully did, refute that, and proceed with sense perception. He could start with sense perception and, and use reason in an Aristotelian way and get very far into it. But he said, there's a point at which reason stops. Reason can take you only so far. It can't take you all the way to God. And therefore we need revelation at certain critical points. Now he's most famous for his five proofs of God. When you see them here, he, and they're all examples of particular things that he examines and asks the question, why? For instance, motion. Why motion? There was an original first mover who is God. Cause, there's a cause for everything. That may, it necessitates an uncaused first cause. There's contingency. One thing is contingent upon another. So there is a necessary being that is not contingent upon anything. There's perfection, degrees of perfection. So there is the most perfect being. And of course, there's design in the universe, which demands a designer, a creator. In Osmond's view, Aquinas' view of salvation was that love, the love from God that saves us, arises as a voluntary act within the soul as a result of the divinely infused habit of grace. What is that? Well, Aquinas believed in predestination. He believed in election. But he believed that God gave to the elect what he called the habit of grace. That is an inclination in their hearts to believe, a, a grace that, that activates uh, and motivates them, uh, their faith, and creates their faith. And he believed that sacraments 
are instrumental causes of grace and salvation. And that's the view of universals being in the things at moderate position. But sacraments are only secondary causes of salvation. He emphasized the intellect over the will. Now, is that theologically desirable or philosophically valid? Aaron Panofsky, the great scholar said, Aquinas exhibits all the qualities of a Gothic cathedral. He refuted Aristotle on his own ground with rational arguments, but he didn't satisfy everybody. The extreme uh, Aristotelians, the Averroists, and the extreme Platonists both claimed that he misrepresented their positions. And the Franciscans, the other order, opposed him. Their great son, uh, son Bonaventure, uh, was one of them. Their greatest scholar, John Dunn Scotus, uh, disagreed with Aquinas on a number of points. He emphasized will, that is the will of God acting in our wills, and love, the love of God, over intellect. And in the process, affirmed strongly the sovereignty of God. He was called the subtle doctor. He was a Franciscan who critiqued and modified Aquinas and emphasized that everything proceeds from the divine will and that man acts on the inclinations of his will as, as an intellectual appetite. Of course, Aquinas would agree with that, but he talks about the habit of grace. But, but, but to, to Scotus, God, God influences man's will from his will and so will and love are emphasized over intellect that that thomas emphasized his view of god is that god is free and not bound to any object god does not command because he sees something as good rather it becomes good because he commands it so thus he believed in the simplicity of god we've talked about that before that all of God's attributes are in him and, and the infinity of God. According to Osment, his view of salvation was only what God willed in eternity past, what he planned in his eternal plan is primary in salvation. How he accomplished it in time is secondary. And what counts in all of it, according to Osment's view of Scotus, what counts is God's pleasure. The efficacy of sacraments result from God's covenant to be present in them, but sacraments are subordinate to the divine will. Did Thomas and Scotus solve the problem? Aquinas and Scotus dominated this school of realism. Aquinas did a great job of systematizing theology and reached St. Augustine's conclusions using the logic of Aristotle. Scotus refined and emphasized the sovereignty of God and the freedom of man as that which is derived from God, but their work is deep and complex and difficult to understand. And still unanswered is the question, how can I be sure of my salvation? So let's look at the nominalists for a moment, that Aristotelian worldview. Uh, it was also, also called the modern way or the devotio moderna. Probably the greatest of them is William of Ockham, one of the greatest of them, certainly, as far as the extreme nominalism position is concerned. He's famous for his razor, Ockham's razor, that shaves away everything that is superfluous. Now, he believed that there's a difference between God's ordained power and God's absolute power. God's absolute power is he can do anything. God's ordained power is what he actually did. And the Bible is in the realm of God's ordained power. So he wanted to shave away everything except God's ordained power, but that leaves the Bible. Now, to say that God cannot give grace to those who do good works, said Occam, is to limit God. Well, the Bible certainly teaches that we are saved by grace and not by works. We know that. But we still can't say that God couldn't do it if he wanted to. Uh, 
And so he shaved away everything but what we know that God has done. And we leave the possibility open that God could do anything. So we avoid generalizations, we avoid concepts, and we stay with what we know that God has done and said. So God could save anyone without these infused habits of grace that Aquinas talked about. And there is no relationship between salvation and grace-induced habits of love, although God normally saves people so, but not of necessity. Like Scotus, he believes salvation is never dependent on qualities within a person, but on the faithfulness of God to his word. But Malcolm thought it sounds reasonable that God would reward prior moral effort with an infusion of grace. Now, another nominalist, Thomas Bradwardine, disagreed. He was a university professor at Oxford and later became Archbishop of Canterbury. He strongly refuted Pelagianism and anything that resembled it, and he attacked the Oxford version of the Devotio Moderna. And he developed a case for salvation as taught by St. Augustine, and was one who strongly influenced John Wycliffe. We'll be talking about him a little bit later. And then there's Gregory of Remini, in very much in agreement with Thomas Bradwardine, who reaffirmed Augustinian theology in refutation of Pelagianism, as he perceived Pelagianism growing in the devotional Moderna scholars at Oxford. He was not interested in this moderate realism of either Thomas Aquinas or Duns Scotus. He advocated covenant theology, and he adopted the salvation concepts of St. Augustine, which is interesting because he's listed with anomalous. He believed in the fallenness of mankind. He believed that salvation was by grace alone and was totally a work of God. He believed in predestination. He believed in the divine initiative and justification. He believed that all resources for salvation were located outside human nature. The reason that he is a nominalist is really the reason that Saint Augustine, that Occam was a nominalist, that the Bible is a thing. It exists in the realm of what God has indeed done. Now, Wittenberg reformers, with their emphasis on grace and their opposition to Pelagianism, seem to have rediscovered this school of thought, that is, Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon. And according to Osment, Gregory of Remini's view of salvation, without the assistance of grace, man is completely incapable of morally good acts, and he had an uncompromising Augustinian Scotus doctrine of supralapsarian predestination, that is, uh, preceding even the fall. This was a plan of God from the beginning. So we end our study of scholasticism, and next week, Lord willing, let's look at some heresies in the Middle Ages and how that helps us to understand denominations today. Thank you for joining us for our study today. Hope you found it profitable. Is it uh, somewhat difficult at points? Well, of course. But, it's, but if we can understand this is that, that goal of trying to reconcile faith and reason and faith and science from two different standpoints. Uh, so I hope you have a great week. I hope uh, and pray that the, the love of, that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you all, now and always.